Good morning. Um, welcome to PLA webinar series. Welcome back. It's been a while since we've done one of these. So welcome everybody um, that has been with us before. And uh, we've had a bit of a break. And welcome to anybody that's new that's joining us for the first time. Today's webinar is Play in Our Smart City Future, brought to us by Lark Industries with presenters Ryan Longford, the sales manager from Lark Industries, and Yeyan Hook, the director of Hook Consulting, and hosted by myself, Mark Band, the CEO of Parts and Leisure Australia. Before we start, and in the spirit of reconciliation, Parts and Leisure Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Before I pass over to Ryan and Yane, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, the presentation will go for about 30 minutes today, followed by uh, questions and answers. There is a chat bar on the right-hand side of your screen, if um, if you can see that and make yourself familiar with it. Uh, and if you'd like to now, just even introduce yourself, let us know who's there. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, please feel free to put those in, and I'll try to field as many of those as I can at the end of the session. If there's any technical difficulties, which we often know these things are not foolproof, um, there will be, uh, we can move you into a, a different room. You don't need to do a thing. Just sit tight uh, and I will move us into a separate room. The only thing you may have to do is if you have typed a question, you probably have to retype that in because we will lose that in a new room. But hopefully that doesn't happen. So introducing today's speakers, Ryan Longford. Good morning, Ryan. He is a highly specialized product manager in play and exercise equipment for all ages. Ryan has expert knowledge of equipment design, consultation, supply, and installation for schools and public and outdoor spaces. Previously, Ryan has worked in the manufacturing industry in bespoke sheet metal fabrication as a sales manager and graduated from the University of Technology in Sydney with a double degree in business and international business. To ensure he's always at the forefront of the latest trends in play and exercise, Ryan has undergone training at factories of Lark's respective partners, including Yelp Interactive, uh, and on several occasions. Uh, these are to, to more deeply understand the nuances of the concept designs, engineering, safety compliance, manufacturing process, and the testing requirements. Yeyan Hook is the director of Hook Consulting, a smart cities urban design and town planning company out of Western Australia, sorry, Perth, Western Australia. Uh, Hook Consulting was developed with the aim of assisting government agencies, private entities, not-for-profit organizations, and local governments to integrate smart technology into their design and planning projects. Yeyan graduated with a first-class honours degree studying at Curtin University in urban and regional planning and the City University of Hong Kong, where he studied architect architecture and civil engineering. Professionally, Yeyan has worked both nationally and internationally, completing various city-shaping projects. Gentlemen, welcome both. We've got Ryan with us. <laughs> Good morning, guys. Appreciate welcome. it, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to... Hand over to yourself, and uh, first of all, yeah, and please uh, explain your 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 name because we had a bit of a problem trying to pronounce it this morning. <laughs> yeah, sure, no worries. Hey, everyone. Uh, so my name's Yayan Hook. Uh, nothing like how it uh, looks or sounds. <laughs> so yeah, I E U A N. Uh, pr pronounce Yayan. Yeah. So there we go. And that's our original down <laughs> on my notes. <laughs> yeah, so guys, I'll, I'll I'll pass it over to you. Um, um I think uh, uh, Ryan, you're speaking first. So over to you guys. Great. Appreciate it, Mark. Thank you. Um, so thanks, everyone, for joining today. Uh, I'm sure there's a few familiar names that have jumped on board that I've uh, met and spoken with over the years, um, potentially a, a, a some new faces as well. So uh, great to have everyone on board. Um, I just want to start with a sort of an opening thought. Um, and uh, you can see what's on the screen, but it, advancements in technology impact every aspect of our lives, how we work, experience and live. Our smarter existence uses technology to enhance livability, workability and sustainability. And these will be very much the topics we speak about today. But seemingly in Australia, this smart philosophy has yet to extend to how we play. Can we equally enhance how we play in the same way we strive to enrich our lives through technology? Um, so on that opening note, um, we'll run through a brief overview of what we're planning to run to discuss today. Um, so Yane will start things off and have a, a bit more of a broad brush um, picture as to what smart cities are, what they involve, what the emerging technologies are, um, the design, all the nitty gritties of what forms good planning and structure for a smart city. Um, 
and then I'll continue through a little bit more specifically on play um, and what that looks like, uh, where it's come from, where it is now, um, some of the successes we've had in Australia and also then potentially the objections that we've seen along the way and potentially some of the reservations that you might have for wanting to uh, invest or uh, adopt these seemingly new technologies. Um, so that's sort of the run sheet for today. Um, but I'll initially pass over to Yayan to um, set the scene and, and, and dive into really what uh, a smart city is. Yayan. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for that, Ryan. Uh, hey, everyone. How's it going? Uh, so today I'm going to be speaking about smart cities and technology integration and overall how we can make more smart and sustainable spaces. So um, first I want to kind of start off with our key aim here at Hook Consulting, which is also a kind of an aim that I think we as consultants, uh, government departments and tech providers can also adopt. And this is the aim where we should aim to see the creation of smarter and more sustainable spaces. Uh, through the integration of technology into our urban design, our town planning and landscape projects. And so we should adopt this approach as applying these aims will enable us to in turn uh, change our existing urban areas into more smarter and sustainable spaces. And so, so when we talk about smart cities, we can mean a number of different things. Uh, but when we talk about smart cities in our parks and leisure professions, uh, we're talking more about an interconnected urban area. And this is one that integrates uh, firstly, smart technologies, uh, also infrastructure, and also a series of networks. And so these integrations open up quite an interesting future uh, for our parks and open spaces, as ultimately these uh, elements can create a city into quite a unique space. And it's a space that is you know, sustainable, also very innovative for the future, but it also creates a space that is very globally competitive going forward. And so now within a smart city, we have these kind of uh, technological building blocks, which are known as smart technology. And so these are the actual technological elements in the space, and they have uh, three key elements. So the first thing that we, when we refer to smart technology, we refer to physical devices. So these are the devices that are interconnected with one another, and they can communicate with one another through a network. So for example, these are, say, like sensors and lighting and Wi-Fi. And so the next thing is the Internet of Things, which is also known as the IoT. So the Internet of Things is a computing concept that connects all these physical devices that we just discussed uh, to one another. And again, that can be through Wi-Fi or it can be through more of a uh, different form of network, which say is a more high frequency network band, such as LoRaWAN, which is something that a lot of uh, local governments are beginning to integrate into their localities. And lastly, we have the creation of big data. So uh, big data is created and communicated through those first two things that I just discussed, the physical devices and the internet of things. And it's really valuable because what uh, the big data can be used for is to predict and forecast trends for the future. And ultimately that's really important because this is able to inform our decision-making going forward and also can guide a lot of our different management measures. And so drawing back a little and talking more about the theory of a smart city, uh, the theory of smart city is underpinned by six key pillars. So the, these, all these pillars practically relate to the natural and built environment as we see it, and also relates to all elements of human life. And so these pillars include people, uh, living, the environment, mobility, governance, and also the economy. And so as these technologies are beginning to influence these aspects of our everyday lives, uh, we are beginning to see uh, quite a few emerging technologies that are beginning to be integrated into our open spaces. So uh, now in terms of what we're seeing today, parks both nationally in Australia and also across the world are beginning to integrate forms of technology. And so I've got a couple of real world examples here that are on a few different uh, scales. And first we have a neighbourhood scale park uh, in Perth known as Kinkuna Park. So this park is located in the city of Wanneroo. Uh, it's 1.5 hectares in size, and it's more of a multi-use playground and also a large community space, which you can see to the north there in the grass area. And so now the interesting, about it, interesting thing about this park is that this was Australia's first smart playground, and it combined digital and physical play activities. And so in terms of the smart technology elements that were in this space, uh, the park is firstly equipped with Wi-Fi, it also had smart lighting, which was powered through solar. Uh, it also had a series of smart benches, 
And it also had something really interesting, which was augmented reality and technology. And so what this was is that on the, uh, on the wooden playground that you can see there, um, there was little scannable tokens that was affixed to many of the different structures. And if you had your smartphone and you scanned the token on your camera roll or by an app by the company, uh, it created a digital play experience that users could interact with in the space, which is you know, quite a draw card and something that's really cool. And so this park was quite revolutionary in terms of the beginning of the smart park movement and also realising the potential of activation and the potential of technology integration into these spaces. And then from going from that kind of neighbourhood scale, uh, this, this project is more on a smaller local scale and it's a smart streetscape uh, that was 900 metres squared in size and it's known as Bird Street in London. So uh, this project was a retrofitted uh, normal street space originally and then it got changed into an interactive uh, park and play area with a number of different uh, technology integrations. So the most interesting one was, as you can see in these images here, was the site incorporated energy generating paving. So what this does is that as you walk along the space, uh, from the pressure and the impact of your steps, uh, kinetic energy was generated, uh, which is then fed into an existing uh, electrical grid within the space. And then that was fed back into the area, which was used to power the, the lights, uh, the drink fountains and other technological elements in the space. Uh, in addition to that paving, uh, other tech integrations included smart lighting, uh, Wi-Fi, sensors, and something called an air purifying bench, which was very interesting in itself. So I don't know if you can see my mouse on the screen. In the middle image there on the bottom, there's a wooden bench, which was a, equipped with sensors. And what it did was that it uh, sucked in the air, had air quality sensors that determined uh, what kind of quality the air was, purified it, and then pushed it back out of the other end. And I think this... Um, what this example really shows is that it's a really innovative approach and one that's also sustainable, but also it's creating more of a self-sufficient local space within a huge city. And then on more of a, a regional scale now, so going from neighbourhood local to regional, uh, one of the world's smartest parks uh, is the 227 hectare uh, Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in Stratford, which is also in London. And so this park was constructed uh, within a remediated industrial wasteland and it was host to the 2012 Olympic Games. And so there were many different tech integrations uh, into, these, into this space. And again, it incorporated the energy generating paving, which I just discussed before. Uh, but also very interest, interestingly, in the bottom left picture you can see there, it incorporated energy generating exercise equipment. Uh, equipment. So this was also part of that self-sufficiency and sustainable angle where if you went on this equipment and you yeah, did a bit of cycling, a bit of pull, pulling and pushing, uh, that kinetic energy generated, uh, there was a USB port on each technological element and you could put your, your USB cord in and say, charge your phone, charge your laptop. And then, so it's created that self-sufficiency as you, as you cycled, as you pedaled, uh, you created energy that charged your phone. Uh, and also, if you didn't have a te technology device connected, it would then feed that energy generated uh, back into the electrical grid which could be used to power other technological elements within the site, um, which, I think, which I think is fantastic. And then in addition to that, there were a couple other tech integrations. We had autonomous vehicles, which you can see in the top left up there. Uh, also microclimate and air sensors. We had various uh, animal sensors, smart bins, uh, also energy generating lighting, which there was two forms. So there's one with uh, solar panels, but also near the Olympic Stadium itself. Uh, there was these huge lights which had huge wind turbines on top, which are uh, which pretty interesting. Uh, also Wi-Fi. And lastly, there was a lot of environmental sensors and conditions, but they also looked at crowd movements. So they could guide people and determine their uh, patterns and their flow. And so uh, even though technology has begun to be integrated into these open spaces, which probably in the, in successfully in the last five or 10 years, uh, there wasn't much previously known about the benefits to community members, uh, ratepayers, or local and state governments. And this was framed by a number of different uh, academic authors where it was stated that uh, the benefits of smart technology integration are unknown. And this is by Caird and Hallett in 2019. Uh, there is little research regarding the incorporation of smart technology and its ability to support the social life and place activation of parks. 
And then lastly, uh, the relationship between smart cities, urban design and landscape architecture has not been adequately explored. And this is why by Delna in 2017. So as you can tell, these are some pretty big gaps in the research here. So starting in 2019, uh, I began a research paper that was titled, How Can a Design Response Inform the Incorporation of Smart Technology and Support the Social Life of Parks? And I am to find out what those previous gaps in the research were. And so in this paper, I explored and determined, firstly, what the benefits of smart technology integration actually are. Uh, secondly, how does technology improve the social life and activation of parks? And lastly, what is the relationship between smart cities, uh, parks and leisure and urban design? So to conduct uh, this piece of research, I had to have quite a systematic methodology. So which first, this involved me traveling to all different park spaces in Perth and did a bit of benchmarking and assessing what was currently on the market and how it was being integrated. And then I was able to hop onto a plane and travel to London for two weeks and visit park spaces there. And I uh, timed that very well because I got back to Perth two days before they closed the borders. So I was very lucky to do that. And so um, the aim of doing this kind of systematic research approach was that I wanted to speak to the community members and learn their perspectives on uh, smart technology itself. But then also I wanted to speak to the technology startups and also the local governments and learn about their perceptions. Uh, so I did this through a four stage research method process. And so this included a series of park audits, uh, as well as a community survey, uh, expert interviews, and a final community workshop. And so these research methods allow me uh, to learn how people would use technology in parks and find out a very key question. And so this key question was, uh, would smart technology in fact increase park visitation and park usage? And so and from the completion of this project, I was able to find out that, in fact, yes, uh, technology integration would increase park usage and by quite a significant number. So from the respondents in my study, which was over 200 people, uh, I was able to find that, firstly, 96% uh, of people uh, stated that they would visit parks more often if smart technology was implemented. And then further to that, I was also able to find that 91% of people would spend longer, spend a longer amount of time in park spaces uh, due to technology integration, uh, with 43% of those people saying that increase would be from between 30 minutes to one hour. Now, I think these are some quite interesting findings as this shows that innovative and interactive technology has definitely a real potential in increasing the activation of park spaces. So I kind of, once I learned those initial findings, the statistical ones, I wanted to kind of take this a step further and find out what kind of technologies that the community actually wanted to see. So when I dug a little deeper, the first thing was, is that people want to see technologies that they can physically interact with as users and gain a benefit from. And then the second was that people wanted technologies that they couldn't necessarily see, but they knew would increase the sustainability and the amenity of a park. So again, these findings are quite interesting uh, because it shows that there's two forms of technology integration uh, that we can use going forward. So firstly, it's that kind of first level, which is the interactive, innovative technology, but then also technology that you can't see, but into, uh, sorry, but then uh, increases the sustainability and also the amenity of a park space. And now, Tying, back to the, tying these findings back to my research process, uh, my paper also had a design component, which did a theoretical redesign of a blighted park space in our Perth CBD, known as Russell Square. And so based on all the participant responses and the desired technologies for the space, uh, I then did a redesign of the park to include multiple technology integrations. And so this was in order to create an innovative, smarter and more sustainable space where I included uh, smart interactive playgrounds, uh, energy generating paving and exercise equipment, uh, as well as smart benches, augmented reality, uh, pedestrian counters, smart lighting and sensors. So quite a few different things. And those are all based off um, community replies as well. And so ultimately, I think what this shows is that these kind of implementations will enhance parks to not just be your stock standard normal parks, but these will then create more sustainable, more innovative spaces, which will have one, uh, improved visitation outcomes, 
uh, but also improved usage outcomes from the community. And when you take a step back, I think um, this is going to be interesting with what Ryan will be talking about soon because the Yelp Interactive range with their playgrounds falls into this key finding from my research. And this was that people wanted to see technology integrations that they can physically interact with and gain the benefit from. And so this benefit can be in terms of uh, physical, improved physical fitness, and also with interactive games, it could be cognitive uh, stimulation and uh, increased ability. And so going on to a couple of the key considerations when you design a smart city, uh, one of the first key things is strong data encryption policies for data management. Because whenever you try and implement something smart into a space, even though it has good intentions, the community is always questioning data integrity and always about, oh, it's going to be collecting data on me doing this, doing that. And so the first thing to always set up is to have a data management plan, which provides access of the data that's created from the tech devices, uh, only access to certain people, uh, as well as strong management measures around where it's stored and how it's stored and also encryption codes on all the data that's created. Uh, next, uh, the next consideration is more about management measures. And this is in terms of who takes care of the technology. Is it an IT department? Is it a parks and leisure department? Uh, who takes care of the data that's managed, as well as the maintenance measures as well? Uh, next is something that's, which I think is very important, which is the planning policies. And so it's always good to have a, a unified vision and approach as well as objectives going forward. And I think something that isn't happening a lot at the moment, but is beginning to start over east, because I, I read one the other day for the New, Newcastle City Council, is that some of the local governments are starting to create um, smart city strategic plans until say 2030 uh, to, 20, to 2050, which holistically look at a space and then determine what technology would be best going forward, as well as stating uh, high level objectives and visions. And I think that's a really strong approach for guiding what technology goes into our urban area. Uh, next, we also have uh, landforms and landscape considerations. So with tech integration into parks, it's more something that you can't just put tech into the space. It's got to be site responsive and work with the landscape because if it works against the landscape, there's more a chance of the technology being broken and need to be repaired. So that's definitely a key, key consideration going forward. Um, next is also the networks and the services. So as, as, we, as I discussed before about having Wi-Fi to transfer your data, you could also use um, the LoRaWAN, which is more of something that local governments are beginning to adopt now, which is that high frequency uh, data transmission band, which is also you don't have to pay as much royalties as you would with Wi-Fi as well. So that's very, that's a plus, saving a bit of money. And um, lastly as well, the connectivity and the communication element between the smart tech. So you want to get technology devices that you know can connect to the same network as well as communicate with each other, because in the end, that'll create you more data rich and better spaces. So in terms of the, the future of parks and leisure and where do we go from here, I think the first key thing is first understanding the opportunities. With technology, we've got the opportunity to create more sustainable, uh, data driven, uh, as well as innovative spaces. But we also have a number of factors that we can improve uh, through this technology integration. And so the first thing is enhanced cultural and heritage factors, uh, which we can use technology to recognize the elements and strengthen these elements in a space. Uh, next, a lot of smart technology uh, is able to provide educational and learning opportunities. And so this is through interactive play elements where a certain technology that you interact with can teach you about certain topics within a site, which is really good for uh, integrations near schools, uh, as well as hospitals and medical uh, facilities. And lastly, and something that I think is very key is that tech integration also has uh, healthy, active by design and in inclusivity opportunities because the tech can be used by everyone. So this enables you know, a holistic approach to the users of the space, as well as, you know, including the senior community and also people with disabilities. And then overall, I think that this is a very exciting time for parks and leisure spaces. And whereas we as consultants, uh, local and state governments, as well as tech providers, uh, have, the, have the ability to create these smart spaces. And so uh, now to help achieve this, uh, here at Hook Consulting, we offer a range of smart city services that are able to explore the potential tech integrations into an area, 
uh, and also assess the community's perspective on technology and overall determine if this is something that they desire. So the first thing we offer is a smart cities and open space audit, uh, which eliminates the guesswork to in, in incorporating tech and applies a quantifiable evidence-based criteria approach that a assesses an open space and determines what technology would be best used and what technology, what community members uh, that techno that um sorry uh, that what community members what kind of technology that they would best desire for the space is it tech that uh, increases sustainability or is it tech that they want to physically interact with? Uh, next is the community surveys and engagement layer that we offer, which again uh, is able to just determine a community's perspective and preferences for tech integration. Uh, and this also allows for a kind of a co-designing process with the space where people have a say in what technology goes into a space and overall creates a more positive and better outcome for town planning, urban design and landscape projects. And so the last piece of advice we offer uh, to local governments and tech providers is consulting advice. And so this is providing a, a smart city perspective to works in progress master plans and also to uh, draft planning strategies. And uh, yeah, I just think with technology integration going forward, we've got a lot of opportunities ahead of us. And yeah, just want to say a big thank you to everyone uh, listening to us here at Hook Consulting. And I'd like to pass over to Ryan to talk about the Yelp Interactive Branch. Well, thanks, everyone. Beautiful. Thanks, Yann. Appreciate it. Um, no, no I think that sets a, a really good foundation of where we go and, and migrate through into, into the play discussion. And he's obviously touched on a, a number of um, elements of um, play integration that's been done in some of his research, um, but potentially not to quite the extent um, that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so the, the first part I want to really start on is defining what smart play is or smart technology in play. Um, and what is it that we really hope to achieve from play? That's sort of the overarching question we need to ask. Um, engagement. Uh, we've got a list here of six six criteria. So engagement, will a space be engaging for children? Um, experience, is it a, a space that can um, provide a, a new experience, um, something to, to learn? Um, Socialisation, the ability to engage with other children as a, a key um, de developmental process. Um, physical and mental challenges, um, learning through play whether uh, passive or not, um, and inclusion. Um, so really the, the, the premise of what we want to do, though, is around designing fun, um, but there are a whole number of underlying criteria that really that we, we try to satisfy in good play design um, and, and for children to experience. Um, so the question I would really ask then is if we're satisfying these criteria with new ways to play, is that an effective way of addressing play? Um, because there are there has been a number of objections, objections um, over the years that we've been supporting these interactive and, and uh, smart technologies. Um, but I think we're really coming to the forefront now as to how they can start forming um, our public spaces. So really here it's smart play is not about replacing traditional play. We're not going to remove the swing, the slide, the rocker um, and replace it with smart technologies. It's it's highly about complementing um, and, and supporting traditional play functions um, and offering alternatives. That's the, really the key. Um, what we find, what you'll find with children is they there's not a one size fits all type criteria. Um, some kids are interested in colours and bright themings and, and farming type applications or space, for example, um, where others are, are more engaged by passive tactile nature play, which is obviously a, a popular trend um, at the moment. Um, the other side, it may be more around passive cognitive imaginative role playing um, play experiences or, again, those that seek adrenaline, so going up the tallest slide uh, the, the tallest climbing structure, the longest flying fox, all those sorts of things. So there isn't this jack of all trades. Um, and that probably then creates the challenge as designers and specifiers in 
uh, maintaining variety in place-based design. How do we keep creating spaces that are new, exciting, e engaging, and providing all those traditional values that we want to achieve? How do we keep doing that time and time again without recycling the same swing, slide, rocker, seesaw experiences that children are, are, are all accustomed to? Um, so that's a little bit of what we'll sort of dive into. The basic definition really of, of smart play is uh, simply where the digital and physical world meet around us through play. So the digital element is really the technology that delivers the gameplay and the physicality is that it's actually in the outdoors. Um, some of the misconceptions, though, that we, we really hear is, you know, uh, children are already on devices all the time, so we don't want to start forcing technology down the throat. Um, the reality there is that smart play doesn't involve screen time. Um, there's no, you know, handheld devices, for example. You're not staring at a screen um, for engagement. It's more around the physicality, running, moving, agility, learning, all those types of elements. Um, and the other misconception is that children are playing online too often as it is. So um, I guess the response to that is that smart play isn't designed to keep children immersed in a enclosed, sheltered online um, environment. It is about being outdoors, engaging with, you know, in, in, in public space, with the community, with friends, with family. Um, so they're really probably the, the two responses initially for those who haven't really dived into interactive play is that it's device driven and it's online driven. And, and they're probably the, the two real outlying um, points to raise that the that, um, smart technology isn't about those things. Um, again, it's, it's really just a creative way to encourage people to play outdoors, be active, socialise and learn. Um, and you'll start seeing on some of these slides through the background some of the particular technologies that are available to, to offer these types of experiences. So where, do we, where did we begin? Um, the history of smart technology. So Lapset started the concept uh, in the early 2000s um, and developed what you see here called the Smart Us um, as a playful learning experience. So it was the world's first inter internet connected outdoor play experience. Um, and it really set the foundation for the future of play. Uh, by comparison, if we compare in that early 2000s market, the, uh, the out, the, I guess the smart technology and gameplay experience that we have, a little bit tongue in cheek, obviously everyone remembers the old Snake and Nokia phones. Uh, that was probably the, the extent of play outdoors that people would be experiencing that were internet connected. Um, obviously the, the emergence of things like PlayStations and things, they all existed, but they were again, the, the, the traditional textbook um, indoor um, play for children, which we're trying to move away from. So here's a bit of a dive into um, the history. Um, you see here the, the available Yelp technologies um, by market segment. Um, and if we look on the right-hand side here, going back to as early as 2007, um, which is just a, a few years after Lapset developed the Smart Us platform. Um, so you can see quite a, a tenure of um, development and research over the last 13, 14 years from our partners in the Netherlands, Yelp. Um, so I guess that's a, one of the misconceptions is that this is a new technology. This is something that hasn't been done before, um, hasn't been tried and tested, and we haven't seen the results. Um, and we'll dive into that a little bit more as we progress along and start to see what really makes the technology smart. Um, so you can see on the top right here actually that uh, there are 932 interactive smart technology products installed globally. Um, so that may be a number that surprises some. Um, we certainly don't have a, we've only got a very small proportion of, of that figure here in Australia, um, but sessions like this and, and, and continuing the education is um, hopefully going to increase that number and increase the, the prominence here in Australia in the years to come. 
So if you look at some of the data here, the, the, the trend that's most impressive is from the early development on the left-hand side in 2007, you can see a, a small quantity of initial trial units. Early days, you can see 07, 08, 09, which is the slow into, I guess, the early adopters of the technology. But really from 2013 and onwards has been a sort of an exponential upward trajectory of adoption of these smart technologies. Um, and it's not just, uh, I guess Yelp is, is based in Europe, but it's not just in Europe. Um, some of the biggest jumps you'll see from 17, 18 was uh, the adoption of internet of the smart technologies into the US market. So they've only been going now for a short period of time, but there is uh, some substantial numbers being installed. Um, one of the other criteria here is the locations in which these smart technologies have been installed. Um, the the feedback we get is that they need to be in regional or destinational places, installing them in Fed Square or in really prominent high volume, high traffic areas. Um, and that isn't necessarily the case. Uh, you'll see some of the verticals here, schools, holiday resorts, healthcare, sporting facilities, retail, family entertainment, and of course the largest red section there, which is in public space in city spaces. So this is a really good indication of all the interactive products that are uh, available and that are installed globally. You can see Little Old Australia there with four products installed currently and one over in New Zealand. So a, sh uh, you know, a short way off the, the vast numbers that you see in Europe, Middle East, Asia and the US. Um, where the next real emerging market for this technology. Um, there's no reason why we can't be the likes of the US and parts of Europe in terms of adoption. Um, and I think we're on the cusp of that um, being achievable. Now, this data, uh, as you see, it is just a screen grab, but this is actually shown in real time. Um, and you'll see these statistics. You can actually jump on to the Yelp website on the Yelp online app and see which games are actually, which products and which games are actually being played in real time globally. Um, so you can see at the time of these this information, there was 50,000 games played in that particular week, over 2,000 hours of the 932 products, 570 of them were online at the time. Now that means that a number of them were um, in hibernation state, so they weren't being, they weren't being operated. Um, you can then break it down by individual product, in terms of of those products which are being played and then also by country. So it's a good little snapshot just to really see um, how the interactives are being used and engaged and adopted globally. Um, and obviously the, the work that needs to be done here in Australia to, uh, to reach these sorts of levels. So what exactly is Smart Play? The engagement is really around the senses listening, touching, reacting, moving, engaging, and socializing. Um, for example, the sonar is, it utilizes uh, uh, camera technology to focus on movement and motion to have various games around interaction with the cameras and the, the associated pads underneath, which is this left arch looking image here. Um, the Sutu, the Toro, and the Memo are all touch sensitive products that all have audible instructions, LED lights, and touch sensitive panels for gameplay. Um, again, they're all based around reaction, movement, and engagement. So it's not just a static gameplay of cause and effect where you touch a button and something else happens. It's a, an immersive experience um, designed for one, two, multiple people, uh, engagement in teams, and also with families. You can see as an example here, with the Sutu product, there's a, an app available um, and it allows you to connect to all the Sutus globally and see the high scores um, and the scores that are generated by all the users on a global scale. Again, this is just a small sort of novel part of what is possible, um, but with internet connected technologies, um, it gives you the ability to compete with friends nationally, globally, um, and also with um, international stars, uh, with some of these Sutu walls being installed at, uh, at stadiums around the world. Uh, and you have uh, Euro and, uh, and Premier League players 
um, competing and, and logging scores on the uh, on the Sutu that you can then challenge your friends and yourself to try and beat your idols. So a novel engagement, but a, a powerful way for kids to experience things in a different way in an outdoor environment and most importantly for free. So as we've slightly touched on, smart play technology is providing a new and new, new, unique way to play. Um, it's a true inclusive experience for all ages across multi-generations, as I've said, across children, parents and grandparents to play collectively. It's not for the children to play and the parents and the grandparents to stand idly on the, on the fringes with their coffee or their phone whilst the, the children have their fun. Um, the nature of the gameplay encourages interaction with parents and grandparents, um, all demographics, all abilities and all interests. So to, to comment on the, the all abilities nature of, of the interactive technologies, uh, this is a really good snapshot. Um, typically, we try to, we want to move to this inclusionary model on the right hand side. Um, but many play spaces are, are quite exclusionary in that there isn't opportunity for, for um, senior, for disabled, for, for all ability type play. Um, we then, may go a little bit further and, and provide segregation where there might be a, an inclusive swing, there might be an inclusive carousel, but it's still segregating and creates this us and them mentality between children and users of the, of the park. Um, we then get integration where it's trying to combine the spaces together, but really it's, a, again, it's only creating a space within a space. Um, what the internet tech, the interactive technologies do is allow for users to play collectively together and experience together um, in the outdoor environment. Um, and I've highlighted here that it's up to date. So as you can assume that these technologies are all internet connected and part of the internet of things that, uh, that Yayan mentioned. Um, so they remain up to date. The content is evolving, the games are changing and the way that people engage and experience the products is um, ever-changing so it's not a once a sort of a set and forget technology that it does what it does in uh, you know forever there is this uh, this change in how you can engage with it a, a brief snapshot here smart play for seniors so these this is where the, the sonar has been uh, installed in uh, retirement villages in Europe um, to allow them to do dance and movement games so they play music uh, do things like musical chairs um, and it's just a novel and engaging way for the residents to engage, but then also for the grandchildren to be able to play in, uh, in a new and an exciting way. Rehabilitation, Yayan mentioned that in, in his notes as well. Um, this is installed on the rooftop of a hospital in Europe um, and just shows that you don't need to be in a swing, a seesaw or going down a slide. This is in the children's rehabilitation ward. Um, and the Sutu soccer wall and the Phono multi-sport, uh, multi-goal walls um, provide a way that uh, that children can play and have fun. It's it's got sensory sensory engagement, lights, um, congratulation for achievement, all those sorts of things. Um, even when children may not necessarily be feeling at their best. Inclusive, as I've mentioned, so this is an example in the US where it's been installed in an all abilities play space and the sonar becomes the centrepiece for this structure, uh, for this space. So smart play technology offers learning uh, with some of the games, including things like languages, geography, biology, they're customizable, um, geography, languages, um, maths, addition, subtraction, all the usual type uh, games. Um, to offer a learning potential for children outside of the classroom. Uh, now, this is valuable if they're installed to, in proximity to schools with the opportunity for those schools to have outdoor learning classes um, around various subjects and topics in a playful and uh, engaging way. Um, it encourages healthy competition and is highly physical. So all the games involve movement. Um, it's not sedentary as you'd likely be more than likely to expect. Um, the other note here is that uh, Smart Play is safe. Um, they're all installed on flat surfaces. There's no fall zones um, and therefore there's no requirement for costly 
impact attenuated undersurfacing. Um, it could be installed on a concrete surface, for example. Um, however, something like synthetic turf or just a rubber wear face is, um, is ideal. Um, and the products as well are also designed with no entrapments or climbabilities. Um, so they're obviously a, a very safe consideration for spaces. So why exactly is it smart? And this is probably the crux of what we are talking about here. Data, control, insight, adaption, evolution and green. So all the technologies provide data and insight into the products. Um, game usage, game popularity, online, offline status, um, controlling of the products. So controlling operational hours, um, online times, um, all these things that you that provide knowledge um, and I guess, as you said, insight into how to best utilize the uh, the technologies. Um, adaption, uh, we mentioned that it provides all different types of gameplay experiences for different users um, and evolution so that it is continually changing. Um, Yelp develop somewhere between five to six new games um, each year. Um, so the, the content is continually renewable. Um, and there's also the opportunity then to uh, create custom games. Um, so here on the, the green concept as well, um, they can be solar powered. Um, so on all the inter internet technologies, um, they, are, they can be installed as a green solution without 240 power. So there's a 150 milliamp battery included in the base of the structure so it can work even when the sun's not shining. Um, there's then battery optimization and management, um, eco modes for extended times in, in adverse weather conditions. Um, but most importantly, it's, uh, it's free and uh, utilizes the, the power of the sun. So diving into the Internet of Things, uh, as I've mentioned, the, the technologies are all internet connected via 3G, so they're not forming part of a network of council or developer, for example. There's no in network infrastructure required. Um, the 3G modems are provided and managed by Yelp, the manufacturer, so it's a set and forget um, arrangement. Renewable content, as I've mentioned, um, data, statistics, and real-time asset management, which we'll discuss in a moment. So in regard to data, um, you can see a dashboard here, as we mentioned, around the control. Um, you can raise tickets as to uh, issues that may be arising with the product um, that will be sent directly to Yelp for them to, uh, to address immediately. Um, you can change users for accessibilities. You've got things like resets, volume levels for engagement, just if depending on the environment and proximity to neighbourhoods. Um, operational hours. Um, so to have this control is really powerful and this is done by the asset owner. Data, analysis of data. So here we can see an example at uh, an install in McLeod Village here in Victoria. Um, up the top, the, the games that are installed and their popularity and their usage in terms of hours per, uh, per day. Um, you can see the graph here, daily play hours. It shows you how often it's been played on the day. And then also down the bottom, uh, the play activity. So this is the duration in which each session of play is conducted. So the darker green is a longer period of time, which means that um, engagements for long blocks of time so that users are remaining engaged. So here's the installation at McLeod that was uh, that took place in November last year, um, and it, it sort of contradicts that destinational regional installation location. It's st installed in a very natural green leafy uh, location in McLeod with a very natural nature play esque installation in the uh, in the background there. Um, it it doesn't need to be a big modern urban space for these technologies to be successful. Um, and what we'll dive into is some of the, the real highlight achievements um, of, the, uh, of the installation um, and also to show you how the data works. So now this is all accessible by the asset owner. Um, 
this red location here was the installation time. So the product was switched on and the temp fencing was removed from the product uh, at four o'clock in the afternoon. And you can see that it was played for three hours from four till seven, at which point the product automatically shut off for the evening. Um, the following day on the Saturday morning, um, it was played for eight and that for the remainder of that week, it was anywhere between eight and nine hours of play throughout the day, which is almost constant um, constant play with the product throughout the day, which is unbelievable. Um, and the real exciting thing here is it shows that children are engaged with new ways to play, with new technologies, and it remains engaging. Here's an example over now, uh, several months later over Easter, the still the, the level of engagement um, that's being achieved. Um, this is from Good Friday through to Easter Saturday, Sunday, etc. So you would expect a drop off um, on on the Easter period, for example, at points, but it's still showing a, a successful six hour, six, six and a half, seven hour um, level of engagement. So it, it shows that it remains engaging and that's still with the existing game content. Um, without going and changing around and, and refreshing and updating the games. So here's the uh, example. So Runner is the most popular game with 20 hours of gameplay in uh, uh, in the first week of installation. Um, and you can see here the, the bars are, are almost solid. So that's showing that there's almost been consistent gameplay from when the product is turned on at 7, 8 o'clock in the morning all the way through to when it's turned off at 7 o'clock at night. Again, over the Easter period, you can see slightly more white locations, which shows periods of inactivity, uh, and that's falling around lunchtime, which is to be expected. So families are, are all congregating for their uh, Easter lunch, uh, and then again at dinner time. Another example of the memo that's installed up in Queensland at the University of Queensland. So this shows the UQ uh, post COVID. So the Saturday was when the COVID restrictions were lifted in May um, in Queensland. Unfortunately, not all of us, uh, us particularly in Victoria, had to hold on a little bit longer. Um, but that was when the parks were reopened and public spaces were reopened to the public in Queensland. And you can see six to seven hours of gameplay over that weekend. So data's useful only so far as that we can make discernible uh, outcomes and we can form opinions and actions from the data. So what exactly does it tell us? Children are embracing a new way to play. The gameplay experience is engaging and users are playing for extended periods of time. Users are returning to play uh, time and time again. Um, and whilst this is new in Australia, um, sorry, whilst this is new, um, Australia is actually ranked highly amongst smart play users globally. So if we look at this next, looks like I'm missing a slide there, sorry. There's actually a rankings table that you can dive into on the, uh, the Yelp website. Um, and it actually shows all the interactive products globally and their usage hours. Um, and at the, as of the Easter period, the McLeod Village memo and the University of Queensland memo uh, were both ranked 12th and 14th globally um, across all interactive products. So it shows that Australia, um, with the limited number of interactives we actually have installed, there is uh, a propensity to engage and be um, and experience it and be interested by these types of solutions. Uh, and the powerful thing is that it is all measurable and visible through the data. So some of the objections that we hear. Maintenance, um, and I'll touch on these in brief. So maintenance, um, there actually is very few components that form up the interactive products. Um, there's the chassis, the touch sensitive panels, for example, but they're all steel, polycarbonate, heavy duty outdoor constructions. Um, and they're 
by comparison to a traditional play space, for example, you've got a multitude of individual components and elements that need to be considered. Um, with the interactive ranges, there are such a, a small volume of um, products to be mindful of, um, and we would keep them uh, in the country to be able to be changed over at uh, short notice. Uh, longevity, and this is an interesting one. So all interactives installed globally are operational to date. There isn't a single interactive that is not operational and not being played currently. Um, this shows that even from the early days in 2007, the technology has been robust, has maintained, uh, has been maintained and is still operational today. Uh, and this is across all different geographies and, and environments. So it could be in the, the Arctic conditions in Finland and Norway, um, through the Middle East, um, in, in really dry conditions, through Southeast, Southeast Asia in, in humid climates, um, and even in coastal conditions as well. So we've got the power of the data to show that there is longevity in the solution um, and they do last and, by, and that's by design. Um, vandalism, this goes sort of hand in hand with maintenance. There really isn't, uh, the, the typical things can occur like graffiti, um, but the surfaces being made out of um, powder coated steel and polycarbonates, um, graffiti can be easily washed um, and they are designed for high levels of vigorous usage. Um, so the, the polycarbonate panels are 15 mil thick, uh, riot shield glass equivalents. So they're designed and engineered for to, to take bumps and knocks. Um, all the smarts and all the technologies are all internally within the structures, obviously, that can't be accessed under, and they're all under lock and key. Um, so the, the propensity for vandalism is, uh, is quite small, given they are quite big, brutalist steel and, um, and durable materials. Um, price, um, you would probably put an interactive in the vicinity of, uh, of price of a, of a local park. Um, uh, you know, you would get a, a multi-activity unit, a swing frame, a rocker and a seesaw, give or take with installation, and you would be looking at similar sorts of figures um, with some landscaping and, and what have you to that of, uh, of an interactive product. Um, certainly where it becomes more palatable is when you're talking about your regionals and your big developer projects where you're talking around half a million, million dollar type spaces. Um, and there may be a singular structure that, that costs in the vicinity of three, four, five hundred thousand dollars uh, a 10 meter high tower with a 20 meter long slide custom built bespoke construction. Um, and the way we see it is you could take a percentage off these big bespoke structures, take a hundred thousand, what what have you, take it off those large structures and apply it to an interactive technology. Um, the towers still are an iconic feature landmark structure, but then you've also got the ability to now offer smart, interactive, engaging tech play um, to complement this destinational space. Um, so it's, I think it's about a, a reallocation of these big budget projects. Um, and McLeod, I guess, is a good example of a, a, a small local park in a in an unassuming environment that um, the Banyal Council undertook with us directly, um, so certainly a, a viable consideration for local government as well. User engagement and lack of interest—they're the two that we hear that it's going to be a white elephant. It's going to be one of these things that we'll install and people won't continue to play and continue to engage with. Um, the data we showed before is really contradicts this, um, and it's these types of forums to be able to convey this message, I think are really powerful, that there is ongoing user engagement um, and there is ongoing um, adoption, um, not just here locally, but globally. You can see these trends over five, six, seven, eight, nine years. There is still this um, engagement with the technology, um, which is really powerful. And lack of interest, it's much it's one of the same, is that users may not necessarily, may be interested initially, but they get bored with the concept. And I think the data shows that this isn't the case. And the fact that we can have evolving content, uh, we'll see the, the
the game usage and the game popularities, if particular games are dropping off in their usability and we're seeing playtime is reducing, we can create new games, change the game contents up and, and create new fresh content for people or potentially work with local council or work with um, uh, asset owners to create custom games around, it could be around languages to promote uh, various communities um, local history, all these sorts of things that might have new ways to keep uh, users engaged. And just to show our Australian success stories to finish off. Oh, here we go. Here's the rankings. So here, out of the 932 smart technologies, um, McLeod is sitting at number 12 and Queensland sitting at number 14 out of global um, usage rankings, which is uh, really exciting. DJ Station uh, installed at Bicentennial Park. So this allows you to simply place uh, a mobile device on the pad of the DJ Station. You can mix and play your own music from Spotify, from YouTube, what have you, or play uh, some existing music that's built into the unit. Um, again, the memo installed up in Queensland. And then another of the DJ stations is stored up in Queensland at, a, at another youth activation hub that's surrounded by um, skate parks and things like that as well. The memo in McLeod, we've mentioned. And then excitingly, a new housing estate development um, coming to Australia later this year that's going to include the Sutu, the memo and the sonar as a three prong interactive play space. But as you'll see here, includes all the traditional elements that the community would still expect. You've got your flying foxes, your carousels, your basket swings, your slides, your junior plays, all the traditional elements that are necessary uh, to provide a well-rounded space, but also these new emerging interactive and smart play zones that, um, that really can add value to, uh, to spaces. Um, so that's a really quick run through and appreciate everyone's time in, in sticking around and and, um, and also, I guess, asking a couple of questions that have been coming through as well. Um, our details are here on the screen. So by all means, if you'd like to reach out and get in touch with either Yayan and myself, please feel free. Um, I, I consciously didn't want to uh, make this very product centric and more about the smart initiatives if you want to understand things about the gameplays, how the products are used, um, the intricacies of, of smart play, um, please do reach out and we can start diving into those um, a little bit more. Um, and you will also find uh, there's a we can upload a, uh, a, a document with hot links through to some YouTube channels around gameplay videos and, and how the products work um, that we can include for people to uh, to access as well. So thanks, everybody, and uh, Mark, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan and Yeah, Look, um, I, I think um, Lucas uh, Kozowski made a comment in saying that, you know, it's exciting. The 21st century is looking exciting. I don't think this is not a trend. It's it's the way we're going to play from here on in. And, and look, we, we haven't got a lot of time, so I might just take a couple of questions and do that. But what I am thinking is, given the, the interest in this subject, and as I say, it is a – a very important subject and i want to see australia leading the way there by the way and not you know way down the uh, the list and i think organizations like ourselves with yourselves and the industry broadly can actually get that to to market and start working on that so wh where i'm going with this is that i almost think we need a second um teams meeting just to answer some of the questions and i'll, I'll put that to everybody um later and maybe we just put something on in the next couple of weeks yeah. absolutely yeah. Yeah. Is, there's, there's that much coming through it's just um you know, it's hard to keep up. But just one, one quick question came through from, from Tennis SA about how are we measuring uh, participation? I think that's quite important, particularly in sports. Um, is there anything out there which is measuring actual participation in sports facilities? Yeah, and that's probably more for yourself than, than around us. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so that's kind of um, one of the services that we offer at Hook Consulting and one of those place-based, evidence-based approaches is um, assessing a location first based on uh, what kind of visitation is there, so doing site visits and doing a pedestrian count. And then if the technology is successful in being integrated, then we could use um, the data created from those Yelp products, if we use Yelp, for example, and then an additional site audit after it's uh, been integrated. So that's kind of an approach that we offer here at Hook Consulting too. Brilliant. Um, I think, you, look, a lot of these questions you probably answered in, in your presentation. The um, 
one from Catherine was about the the analysis of the and you mentioned the solar on some of these so it's, it's obviously cost neutral but it, um, are there others which have power associated with them that um, and what's the cost benefit analysis being done on those sure. so the traditional technology is uh mains powered so it's just a standard 240 10 amp mains power um the the solar would is optional uh, it doesn't need to be done as such and it can be a hybrid technology as well um, I think Yelp have done some cost analysis. I haven't got the data on hand, but I can certainly um, send something uh, offline uh, around some of the, the, the comparisons, definitely. Great stuff. Look, I'm just going to put a, a quick poll out here um, about Q&A session because we haven't run out of time now. We've gone over, gone over the hour. Um, look, uh, as I say, it's not a trend. It's um, it's certainly something which we have to, we not have to, we want to. And I think it's um, incredible technology. We need to start, you know, moving this forward and, and looking at that. So I'll, I'll watch the poll as it comes in. Um, on behalf of PLA, I just want to thank you two guys for your time today. Um, delegates, if you are not members, please try and get on and support our industry, which supports you. Um, these sessions are free to our members and um, and, uh, and and partners, etc. So please get on the PLA website and support ourselves. And just uh, a reminder that the uh, our national conference is coming up in uh, Lark, and uh, some of the guys will be speaking at that again. So it'll give us a another opportunity to do that, and that's um, on the 12th to the 15th of September uh, at the Sydney Olympic Park. Um, look, I think that's all we've got. Um, we have <laughs> rushed for time now. Um, I think we will probably run a quick. A q a session probably in the next week or so or a couple of weeks um just probably do it via teams or something so people can interact a bit more and we'll try and organize that so look, on behalf of pla guys thank you so much for your time uh, a lot of information there and uh, i'm sure we'll be speaking more on this matter so thank you very much appreciate it thank you guys thanks everyone